Good morning, Grace Community Church. We're so excited that you're here, that you've joined us online, and we're happy to have you today. I've got a couple quick announcements for you before we get to the sermon. If you are interested in sending your child, your um, fourth through sixth grader to summer camp, they're going to wagon train at Hume Lake, our junior highs, um, junior high ministry is going to Meadow Ranch at Hume Lake. Our high school ministries have their beach camp in July. And our satellite young adult group has Ski Wake Surf also in July. You don't want to miss those registrations. They're going to be a lot of fun this year. Uh, registration is still ongoing for the next few weeks. You can access those in our app. You just download GCC Visalia from the App Store. You can go to our website, access them that way. Or if you struggle with either of those things, please call the office. We'd be happy to help you through it and get you registered for those things. You don't wanna miss it. It's gonna be a lot of fun this summer. Another thing that we've got coming up is VBS. And if you're gonna put your kids in Vacation Bible School, um, try to have them registered by next Wednesday, which is the 15th. That way we can accurately plan and make sure that we've got everything ready for VBS. That's gonna be a super fun week. So you don't wanna miss that either. So I hope you're having a great week. I hope you had a great week and I hope you're ready to worship and enjoy the fruit of patience. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, church. So good to see you this morning. Pastor John's on vacation this morning, and so I get the great privilege and joy and honor to open up God's Word this morning. If you've got your Bibles, open up to uh, the book of Galatians. We're going to walk through that, and we're in this series where we're looking at Paul's fruit of the Spirit as he lays it out in Galatians 5. 22 and 23, and we are looking at each uh, individual one of that, that list of the fruit of the Spirit and kind of unpacking and explaining each one. And this morning, as you've already heard, I'm uh, going to be talking about patience. And before I do that, let me, let me just pray for us really quick. Father, what a, what a joy and privilege it is to be here with your people in your house, Lord, opening up your word. I pray and ask that your spirit would speak and guide, to eat, guide each one of us, that it would speak to our hearts uh, this morning, Lord, that it would do what only your spirit can do, uh, that it would bring the, the dead to life, that it would um, speak words of truth, that it would guide and direct us, change our minds, our hearts, uh, give us a greater desire for you alone, Lord, and we pray this in your name, amen. Well, Galatians isn't necessarily a book about patience per se. However, as I have been reading through the book of Galatians uh, a number of times over the last few weeks in, in preparation for this message, I was really amazed at, at all the examples of the fruit of patience that are, that are really all throughout it. Things that Paul talks about, examples he gives of his own life as well as others uh, that are really in, in one way or another, examples of tremendous patience. And so I encourage you, uh, and, and there's more there that I have time to, to talk about this morning. I was cutting all kinds of things that I really wanted to talk about. There's just, there's just not enough time to talk about all these great things. But I do encourage you to, to be reading through Galatians, um, and I encourage you and challenge you to read through it with an eye to look for all the examples of the fruit of patience throughout it, because there's, there's quite a few of them there. But when, when we talk about patience, I think that we often, our minds often go to just this idea of like, like not losing our temper, right? Like staying calm in the midst of frustrating circumstances or in dealing with frustrating people. Um, and that's certainly an aspect of patience. That is, that is absolutely true. And there, that, is, that, that would be an example of patience. But I believe that, that biblical patience, patience that we see as a fruit of the Spirit, as Paul is talking about here, not just in Galatians, but we're going to jump around to a few of Paul's other, let, a few of Paul's other, Paul, Paul's other letters, uh, that as we see what biblical patience Patience that's a fruit of the Spirit looks like. I believe that it's much, much, much more than that. I would say, as I've tried to kind of work through and think through a definition, is that fruit of the Spirit, patience, biblical patience, as I, would, as I was saying, is trusting in God's timing and God's process. And that's our main point this morning. If you're taking notes, um, is, is just that that, uh, that, that we need to be a people who walk in the Spirit by patiently trusting God's timing and God's process. You see, God has a timetable 
that is not ours. Any of you who have lived any length of time and have been a Christian for any length of time can probably like give an amen to that. That, that God works on a timetable that is not our timetable. And more than that, God works in a, with a process and through a process that is not ours. Like if we had a say in the matter, we would probably definitely not go with, with the way God chooses to do things and the time frame in which God chooses to work things out. Um, these things are, are definitely not ours. But patience is trusting in God's timetable and in God's process. And so let's begin walking through various parts of Galatians as we observe from how the Holy Spirit develops patience in his people. Uh, first of all, if, I hope your Bible's open to Galatians. Uh, turn to Galatians 3, verse 6. Paul gives this example of Abraham in his, in his letter. And, he's, he, he, and then later he talks about Hagar and Sarah, and he's, he's using this to communicate to the Galatians about how they are made, made righteous through, through faith and not through their works of the law. Um, but this example of Abraham is a perfect example of patience. Paul says in, in 3.6, he says, Just as Abraham believed God, or trusted, you could say, believed or trusted God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. You see, Abraham and Sarah are a perfect example of a couple who at some times did trust God's timing and God's process, but at other times went around God's process and took matters into their own hands and didn't trust God's timing and God's process and ended up make, making a mess of things. I have this quote I was going to read. It's by F.B. Meyer. And they say, God has, set his, God has his set times. It is not for us to know them. <clears throat> Indeed, we cannot know them. We must wait for them. If God had told Abraham in Haran that he must wait all those years until he pressed the promised child to his bosom, his heart would have failed him. So in gracious love, the length of the weary years was hidden, and only as they were nearly spent, and there were only a few more months to wait, God told him, according to the time of his life, Sarah shall have a son. If God had told you on the front end how long you would have to wait to find the fulfillment of your desire or pleasure or dream, you would lose heart. You would grow weary in well-doing, and so would I. But he doesn't. He just says, wait. I keep my word. I'm in no hurry. In the process of time, I'm developing you to be ready for this promise. The next thing that's important to know when we think about God's timing and God's process is that there's a purpose behind that. And that's your first point underneath that, underneath the main point, is that patience knows that God is shaping us in his timing. You see, God's process and God's timing has a purpose. God's timing and God's process has a goal in mind. God isn't just wasting time just to waste time, just because he has an infinite amount of it. He's not like, I think I'll just take a while and make you wait for no particular reason. But God has a purpose behind it. And that purpose and that goal in his process of things is to shape you and I into the image of Christ. His ultimate goal, his ultimate desire for the course of our life is that through our life we look more and more like Jesus. Flip one chapter ahead in Galatians to 4 verse 19. Galatians 4 19. Listen to what Paul says. He says, my little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Paul's goal for the Galatians and God's ultimate goal for us is that Christ be formed in us. Go back one book to 2 Corinthians. Flip, flip back a few, a few pages. 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, verses 17 and 18. Paul says this to the Corinthians. He says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit is, of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, all of us believers, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed 
into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So do you see what, what Paul is saying? Is that the, the Lord is working this process in us, this ongoing transformational process, turning us more and more into the image of Christ. God's goal for our life, and this is important to remember, God's goal for our life is not our comfort, not our ease, and ultimately not even our happiness. God's goal for our life is our holiness, our Christ-likeness, which ultimately results in His glory. God's ultimate goal for our life is that we become more like Jesus, that over the course of our life, that at the end of our life, we look more like Jesus than when we started. And this is, this is called like spiritual maturity. And another word that we use is sanctification. It's a big, big fancy churchy word, but it means, it means this process of becoming like Christ. It, it doesn't make any sense for someone to come, become a Christian and then, then over like a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, over the course of their lifetime, they look no different than when they started. That's not God's desire, and God is not glorified in that, but God's desire is that we become more like Jesus. And all of the things that we go through in our life, God uses in a beautiful, amazing way to shape us into the image of Christ. So all these things that require our patience, all of these things, God's timing, God's process, He's not just doing that for no reason. God's timing and God's process has a purpose, and it's to shape us into the image of Christ. Let me ask you, what is, that, what is the difficult or frustrating situation you're in? Or another question, who is that difficult or frustrating person that's in your life? We sometimes call them sandpaper people, right? Because they, they rub us very, and they, they cause us to exercise great amounts of patience. And oftentimes we fail in that exercise. <laughs> It's funny from my perspective because I'm seeing like nudging and all of that and like, you know, don't look around. No looking around. That's just eyes up here, everybody. But, but, but who are those people? Maybe it's a neighbor or a coworker, or sometimes, God bless them, even a child um, or, or, you know, an employee or that person that you don't know but who happens to be driving in front of you 10 miles an hour under the speed limit. These are, you know, or, or again, the, the situation, what is the situation that you're in that doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon? All of these things God beautifully and intricately and amazingly uses, and his ultimate goal for all of them is to shape us into the image of Christ. We often pray get me out of this situation as quickly as possible, right? We, in one way or another, we pray that God, that God, anytime we're in a difficult situation or around a difficult person, our, our instant prayer tends to be, God, in, get me out of this. Solve this, fix this, heal this, whatever it is. Get me out of this as quick as possible. But I believe that our prayer, our first prayer needs to say, Lord, keep me in this as long as possible, as long as it takes to form Christ in me. Lord, keep me in this as long as it takes to form Christ in me. Let me ask another question. How many of you have looked back at difficult situations of the past that you have now made it through? Maybe like COVID is a great example that, that we've all gone through and, and are pretty much, by and large, past. But, but there's other situations that we've all gone through in our life. And, and maybe you are past and those are done. And now you have the perspective that, of, of right now where you are able to look back on them. And you, you maybe think, you've, you've maybe thought of these situations and you've thought, I wouldn't choose to go through that again because that was really hard and was really difficult and that really tested me, that was really painful, whatever. Or I wouldn't choose to like be neighbors with that person again or, or whatever. I wouldn't choose to be around that person. But then you think, but I wouldn't trade that for anything because of what that did in me, because of how that uh, like forced me to trust in God, how God developed something in me and shaped me. We have to remember those situations because when we go through them in the present, it's important to realize, you know what, as difficult as this is, I need to be patient because God is up to something that I can't see. God is shaping me in a way that I don't fully understand, that I might be able to look back on in five years or 10 years and look back on this situation and say, thank you, Lord, for that situation. Thank you, Lord, for that person because of what you did. But, but in the moment, it's tough. And so we have to exercise patience. We have to trust that God's timing and God's, pro and God's process has a purpose, and that purpose is shaping Christ in us. Richard Hendricks said, Second only to suffering, waiting may be the greatest teacher and trainer in godliness, maturity, 
and genuine spirituality that most of us ever encounter. Your next point, if you're taking notes, number two, is that patience with people is mercy in action. Patience with our circumstances is contentment in action. Patience with people is mercy in action. But patient, and patience with our circumstances is contentment in action. And I think this is where our lack of patience is oftentimes most visible. When we think of impatience, when we think of losing our temper or not, not being patient, I think this is, these situations are oftentimes what we most uh, tend to think of. And I think they're valid examples um, of, of impatience. First of all, in, in regards to mercy, I think that we become very impatient with people when we have somehow perceived and it may be valid or it may be invalid, that they are somehow wronging us, that they are somehow doing something as an injustice against us. And again, I think oftentimes in our mind, we go to, they are doing that on purpose. Like, they know this bugs me. They know this frustrates me. They're just out to, like, like put me down, or, and they're, they're out to elevate themselves. And we often assign their motives to, to what they're doing. And, and we may know that, we may not. It may, be, um, it may just be our perception. So, but we often think that it's, that it's somehow someone's like injustice towards us. And this could be, again, a bad driver in front of us. It could be a frustrating child or coworker, a spouse. It could be an employee, a customer. It could be just the government, right? That's, a, that's an easy one. Um, and again, they may be legitimate. It may be intentional or it may be unintentional. It may just be our perception. But regardless, regardless of their motives, regardless, we... As Christians, as people forgiven and shown mercy by God, we are called to show them mercy by exercising patience. And the reason is because Jesus first showed patience to us. Look at 1 Timothy. Go a few, few books ahead in one, another, Paul, one, another one of Paul's letters. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 17. 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 17. Paul says to Timothy, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though I formerly was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. And we could all fill our name in there, right? You and I are all the foremost of sinners. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect what? His perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, Jesus shows us mercy for his ultimate glory. And we, in turn, are supposed to exercise patience and show that same mercy to others, even when they don't deserve it. Because you and I didn't deserve God's mercy either. You and I don't deserve God's patience either. Look, in, if, you, if you, don't, you don't have to turn there, but in Matthew 18, Jesus gives the parable of the unmerciful servant. Do you remember that, Matthew 18? He talks about this, this servant who owes this, this king this insurmountable debt, this massive debt that he could never repay in the course of his whole lifetime. And in verse 26, it says that the servant falls on his knees before the king and he asks for, do you remember what it is? He asks for patience. He says, be patient with me and I'll pay it back. And the king shows him mercy and forgives his whole debt. And then the, then the servant turns to another servant who owed him a much smaller debt, like a debt, no doubt, but a much smaller debt than what he owed the king. And that servant, in verse 29, does the exact same thing. He falls on his knees before his fellow servant, and he asks for patience. And the other servant doesn't give it to him. He has him like beaten, he has him thrown in jail, and he is what we call the unmerciful servant. And so church, we have to exercise patience towards our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we have to exercise patience with other people, with non-believers, with people that, that don't deserve our patience. But again, we've got to remember, neither did we. And so we have to be, we, we should not be that unmerciful servant. 
a quick side note here that I want to I want to encourage us with is this might not be true for all of us, but I think for some it is. Is that sometimes the person that we are most impatient with and the person that we show the least amount of mercy towards is ourselves. You ever think about that? We sometimes for some of us we are very quick to forgive others, we're very gracious, we're quick to be patient, but when it comes to our own shortcomings, our own failures before the king who forgives us, we, we don't show ourselves that same patience. We don't show ourselves that same forgiveness. We beat ourselves down. We, we, are, we are harder on ourselves than we would be on anyone else. But, but brother, sister in Christ, don't forget that you are forgiven, that you have been shown that same mercy. And so for some of you, show yourself some patience. Show yourself some mercy. And next in contentment, really quickly, let's look at, at Philippians 4, 11 and 13. I think Paul is, sh- is showing us that that patience with our circumstances is contentment in action. Paul says, Paul says this in verse 11, 4, 4, 11. He says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am, I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let me ask you, where or with whom do you struggle with patience? Is it a situation where you're, or, 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 or things that you have or don't have where it's more contentment? Or is it with a person or, or a situation where you're, like, you're struggling with anger? You're struggling to, 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 to show patience in that situation? Remember who God is and what he has done for you. Show mercy and practice contentment. Number three, patience acts through the Spirit to care for others. Patience acts through the Spirit to care for others. Sometimes I think, I think that we think that patience is, is always just this quiet, humble, like not speaking up, not opening your mouth, just silently enduring the suffering, you know, the, the mistreatment from another person or the frustrating situation you see or a difficult person, difficult situation, what, whatever that is. Sometimes I think that, that, that we think that patience is just like sitting by and quietly enduring it. But that's not always the case. Sometimes I think patience does act. I think a lot of times, actually, patience has action to it. It does move forward. It does engage the other person. It engages in the situation and it deals with a problem. But it always does it with a heart that cares for others. Look at Galatians 6. Go back to Galatians. We're jumping around a lot here. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Again, patience is not always passive. Sometimes patience acts. Listen to what Paul says. He says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, which, which means, and Paul's talking about like spirit-filled people. He's, in other words, he's saying you who are spirit-filled, which is every Christian he's talking about here, you who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Patience has an action to it. Patience isn't always just passive. Patience acts and moves, but it always does so with the other person's best interest in mind. It always does so with a heart and a desire to care for others and see God glorified, to see the other person become more like Christ as well. Patience does act, but again, it's always in the other person's best interest. Go to 2 Timothy. Flip, flip a few verses or a few, few books over to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Paul says, I charge you to Timothy. He's saying, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. So this is a, a, a heavy charge, right? Like Paul is laying on, laying on the line for Timothy. He's like, I am holding you to this. And this is serious stuff. He's saying, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience. So Paul is telling Timothy to, to act. He's saying, reprove, re- rebuke, re- uh, blah, 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 lots, lots of words, exhort, lots of tongue twisters, uh, with complete patience. So he's saying, don't just sit by passively and do nothing. He's saying, as, as a Christian, you have to act in other people's best interest, but do so with patience. 
So again, patience acts, but it acts through the Spirit, through the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that's where it's hard, right? It's hard to know, okay, when do I just sit by silently and let the Lord kind of work in that person's heart? When do I speak up? When do I talk to that person, pull them aside in love and say, hey, I got it. Like, we need to talk. You're I, I, I love you. This is awkward, but you're struggling. Like, I, I see you struggling. Are you, you're going to work in this or, or whatever. Like, it's hard to know when that is, but that's why we need to be people who walk in the Spirit, right? That's why we need to be people who are listening to, to, to the Lord. We, that's why we need to be people who are reading God's Word and having this Holy Spirit working in our, in our lives so that we can have discernment and know when is the right time to, to speak up, when is the right time to, to stay quiet. But make no doubt that patience does act, but again, it acts through the Spirit to care for others. Lastly, number four, patience is produced as the Spirit reminds us of our future hope. Patience is produced as the Spirit reminds us of our future hope. Listen, if you know Christ, if, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, if you have given your life to Him the whole, and the Holy Spirit dwells in you, Know that your patience, your long-suffering in that whatever situation you are in, that, that situation that doesn't seem like it's ever going to have an end date, like this is never going to be done, with that person that just keeps like, grinding against you and frustrating you and like that sandpaper that rubs against you, know that your patience in all of those situations is not in vain. Choosing to obey God, choosing to be a people who walk in the Spirit— to make your life's purpose about becoming like Christ. God sees that. God rewards that. That is not wasted. We have a future. We have a future hope, and that will be rewarded. We must keep our mind on that, and we must continually desire to desire that end. Look at Galatians 5. Go back to Galatians. Galatians 5, verse 5. Paul says, For, th for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Is that your hope? Do we have this mindset that is, that is set on eternity, this eternity with the Lord? Is that our eager hope? Do we know that, that someday all of these frustrations, all of these things were, that God is using to shape us into his image, that will be rewarded? There will be a day where, where all those wrongs will be made right, where justice will be, like, like where God will exact his justice. And do we look forward to that day? Look a few verses ahead in, in chapter 6, verses 7 and 9. Paul says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will also, will from the flesh reap corruption. But listen to this. But the one who sows to the Spirit, I would say, who sows to the Spirit in exercising patience, will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary. What does he say? In other words, let us be patient. Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. Paul is setting our mind on this future hope that we have. And remember that this world is not the end. This world is not like we don't just live to the end of our life and die and that's the end of it and we just have to suffer silently. No, there is a reward in eternity and God sees every silent act of patience that you show to that person that doesn't deserve it. Every time that you hold your tongue or refuse to honk your horn or, you know, show that person you know, what you think they really deserve. God sees those acts of patience. He rewards that. And he is shaping you into Christ's likeness through all of those things. Last verse I want us to look at. Go to Romans. Go back a few, chat, few books to Romans. Romans 8, 18. Romans 8, 18, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. All the sufferings, all the exercises of patience that you and I are forced into are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. Now go over to verse 25. Look what Paul says. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Friend, if, if you don't know Christ this morning, if, you, if Jesus is not your Lord, if you have never bowed your knee to Jesus as Lord of your life and given your life over to him, 
you don't have the ability within yourself to grow in, the, the, to grow in patience. You are, Paul says that in Galatians, you are walking in the flesh, so to speak. You don't have the Holy Spirit inside of you who is, who is able to transform us into the image of Christ. And so my, like, the first thing that you need to do is come to Christ. The first thing that you need to do is give your life over to Jesus. And so I, I, I ask you and would encourage you, come out afterwards, talk to me about that. I'd love to tell you about how you can know Christ. But for us Christians, know that this is difficult, right? This isn't just this light switch that you flip this morning. And then the answer is like, oh, I know the problem. I know why I've been so, like, angry. I just, I need to be patient. Thanks, Stephen. Like, that, that's the answer. All done. No, no worries now. No, this is an ongoing exercise. This is, this is a difficult thing. This is a growing process in our life. But we need to lean into the Spirit. We need to let the Spirit work in us and through us. And we need to be a people who walk in the Spirit. And above all, we need to remember that we have a future hope. And on that day, we will see that it is worth it. And so, brother and sister in Christ, let us patiently trust in God's timing and God's process as the Spirit shapes us to be more into the image of Jesus. Let me pray for us, and the worship team will come up and lead us in worship. Gracious Father, we once again just humbly ask that you, through your Spirit, would empower us to be people who, who, who have the fruit of Spirit more prominently growing and, and being produced in our life. Lord, there are an infinite number of situations and circumstances and people in our life that just, that just rub us the wrong way, that are just difficult and frustrate us. But God, we need your spirit. We need your power to work in us, to be, to be people who show, who show mercy, who show grace, who show patience. Not for our glory, Lord, but ultimately for yours. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. God bless you this morning. Well, as Stephen spoke about our eternal hope this morning, we're going to sing a song about that. So let's stand together.